Hi, I'm Chris Bishop and welcome to this special edition of Political Capital where we take an in-depth look at the mining industry. I'm in Rustenburg, the Platinum Belt in South Africa's Northwest Province. There's a multi-million dollar industry here. Mining's going to be the talk of the town in February. Early in the month, there's the mining in Darbury in Cape Town. And on the 19th, 20th and 21st, there's going to be a judicial hearing by a full bench of judges in Johannesburg into the mining charter, the document that guides black ownership in the industry. It's likely to be a controversial one. But first, let's take you to the grassroots of business that surrounds this multi-million dollar industry. It starts here. This is Rustenburg, once a small town on the road to Botswana. Blink and you'd miss it. Now it is an eye-opening, fast-growing metropolis of half a million people. For years, houses have sprung up like mushrooms overnight, the fruit of millions made from the mines. It's been tough in recent years with job losses and the falling platinum price, but the platinum business rumbles on. Rustenburg sits on the western limb of the Marinsky Reef, one of the richest mining fields on the planet, a layer of ore that spans four provinces and holds 80% of the world's platinum reserves. From this is mine the shiny precious metal for the jewellery business of India and the catalytic converters of the car makers of Europe and Japan. For our story of the business of mines, political capital travelled north from Rustenburg to Northam, a small mining town in neighbouring Limpopo. These dusty roads may be off the beaten track, but they're a short drive to a score of platinum mines. At the end of one of these dusty roads, these two young men have every reason to be pleased with themselves, the kind of fresh-faced and determined entrepreneurs that the marketing companies would die for. If you look hard enough behind the political slogans of monopoly capital and radical economic transformation, you will find these stories of fire and ambition. Five years from now, we want to be listed on the JSE. That, that, that's my goal and passion. Every day, every night, when I sweat, like if I, I decide to sacrifice my... They normally say a normal human being should, should, should sleep between seven and eight hours. So I normally say to people I'm not normal <laughs> because I don't, I don't sleep between seven. Normally when I sleep a, a maximum number of hours I sleep, it, it's six. Emmanuel Mklangu, who has just turned 27, was an electrician with Johannesburg Municipality's City Power Company. Klantla Moshitwa. Age 33, worked for seven years as a shift supervisor underground at a nearby Anglo mine. The two grew up in the same village in Mpumalanga and went to school together. A chance meeting did the trick. I remember from our first meeting, actually that very same day, I never slept at my home. I went to sleep in his house for four months. We stayed together and we worked on this idea now, this bigger picture. Hence you see us up to where we are now. The old people, I'm sorry I'm saying this, but the old people we used to work with, they had this mentality that, uh, you know, when we started, we were so energetic like you. One day you'll be like us. Then I'm like, I don't want to be like you. <laughs> and then I guess I'm at the wrong place. Then I, I, I resigned. The, the, the first year was, was really tough. I, well, the first year was really tough. I, I don't want to lie. At some stage, I went back to my file, looked at my CV and decided I'm applying again because it, it would be so bad. You don't even have money to make a, a mere phone call. How do you go and do a business if you can't make a phone call? You couldn't afford anything. We had one Baki, uh, Mahindra Baki, when we started uh, with Emmanuel. It was quite funny actually because um, we, 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 we just decided that this thing, we're just going to grab the bull by the horns. So whatever we get in terms of resources, we just combine them together. The other time he was laughing at me because we, we, we had to pack a lunch, pa a lunch box <laughs> in order to come and see the mine, mining officials around the area, you know, driving his uh, a, a small uh, course and then we got that buggy. So it was a, a slow but steady growth that actually gives us, when we look back uh, at, at how far we come, we actually could say we, 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 we have done a great deal of uh, uh, effort. In this partnership, Mushitwa runs the operations, Mklangu does the administration. This is what they do. The company is called Afrigem. It employs 74 people making and repairing equipment for the mines. 
These machines and their northern factory make everything from conveyor belts to crushers for the platinum mines. It is a business that has been dragged down by the platinum price. With, uh, with the uh, platinum price going down, the mine starts to slow down in terms of uh, 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 producing or doing their normal uh, maintenance work and, and, and stuff like that. So the first way in which they can uh, uh, minimize the cost is cutting us loose as the contractors, So which makes, us, which makes our lives very, very difficult. The platinum mines are likely to struggle even more in the future, according to Johannesburg-based PGM strategist at Standard Bank, Leroy Nguni. If you assume that uh, PGM prices remain where they are at the moment, um, there's a significant number of jobs that are at risk, um, potentially 22,000 jobs, um, 12,600 um, of which have already been communicated to the market um, that could be lost over the next three, three or four years. For a 100% black-owned company, you would have thought getting business under a government wanting to promote black ownership and business would be easy. Think again. It is very difficult to uh, break that barrier whereby you find people that have been doing the services that you do for years and years and they have contract, big contracts with their mines. And here you are coming up, even though the, the, the BEE uh, structure is now opening doors for us, but it's a bit of a challenge to just break that barrier to the end users. But it's something that we slowly but surely working on by building up on uh, the reputation that we have. To complicate matters further in Northern, there is the overshadowing uncertainty of the amended mining charter that will be the talk of February. This is the document that guides the South African industry in its quest for greater black control of a white-dominated business. I think it's vital, um, particularly to secure jobs in, in the mining industry. We need to start attracting investment. Um, um, I. I do think that um, the ANC would be under pressure to, to show that they are going to stamp out corruption and provide uh, an environment that will attract investment. Um, so I do remain positive that those, those changes will come through and the certainty will, will be there. We need to have, at some point, different players. Where well, some big players do not see any value in playing. Smaller players can come in and play. But we need to explore more because we have minerals here in South Africa at the tune of minus plus 50 trillion rand. These are the people who are saying, come in, let's explore, let's ensure we build more jobs, uh, we mine these minerals that have not been mined. Mining Charter 3, the third rewrite, has been up in the air for five years. It faces a judicial review in the High Court on February the 19th, 20th and 21st. The Chamber of Mines has criticized it, calling it the last nail in the coffin of South African mining. South African mining employs around 450,000 people. The Chamber of Mines says there is around $12 billion in mining investment underway. It believes regulatory stability could mean an increase of nearly $10 billion in investment, creating 150,000 new jobs. It's the certainty and the stability that is most important. And there are one or two things in that Mining Charter 3 that, that are quite difficult you know, for, for an investor to, to square away. We also we compete with other, in, other, other, other locations for investment. And if we put hurdles in place that are so difficult to mount, we will see less investment. So we need stability and we need reasonable hurdles. But attaining this kind of stability is likely to be tough. The judicial review could throw the mining charter out on a number of clauses challenged by the employers. They say the whole document is rushed and unconstitutional. They complain, to name but a few, the minister is acting ultra vires, that is beyond his powers in rewriting the charter. It is against the Companies Act. Dividends to black shareholders be written up after 10 years. The critics say this is tantamount to expropriation. There are other disputed clauses in the mining charter that is likely to help 100% black-owned businesses like Afrigem. 
like the increase in black ownership requirement from 26% to 30% to be maintained at all times, plus the proposed procurement requirement of 70% from black-owned suppliers. This is one reason why these entrepreneurs are watching the progress of the mining charter with interest. Well, it would be a heartbreaking uh, uh, situation for us, more especially uh, young black-owned uh, mining service companies, because, the, like I explained earlier, those doors that we are sitting patiently and waiting for, those are the doors that we would really want to open. Those are the things that we want to happen. So we, we, we cross our fingers that it goes through, but if it doesn't, it's really a, a heartbreaking situation. Not that it will deter us from carrying on with what we are doing, but it will just put us a, a bit uh, on, a, on a setback. Both these entrepreneurs risk their money to set up their own company. They say whatever happens with the mining charter, hard work and risking your own money are the answer to the economy's problems. The whole idea of selling, being in business, you, you should actually... We should actually teach it to children as young as they are. But our systems in, in South Africa, I was very happy uh, when they were interviewing Cyril Ramaphosa, Cyril Ramaphosa after he became the, chair, the, the chairman. He, he, he said he's going to ensure that they are offering entrepreneurship as one of the subjects in school. So maybe that can bring a change. So we, we need leaders with such mentality. Meanwhile, the mining charter issue hangs over the industry. It is likely to be a long, hard road for mining to reach that stability and certainty that could open the gates to foreign investors. Well, that's all from the platinum-rich fields around Rustenburg in the northwest province of South Africa in this special mining edition of Political Capital. Stay with us in the second half. We'll be talking to a mining law expert, Peter Leon of Herbert Smith Freehills, about the prospects of the mining charter when it gets to court. Do stay tuned. Welcome back to the studio this time. In the first half, I mentioned the mining chart of the document that supposedly guides the course of black empowerment in South African mining. Now, on February the 19th, 20th and 21st, it'll be up for judicial review before a full bench of three judges here in Johannesburg. And it's where it'll really be tested to see whether or not it has the legal right to go forward. Now, in the studio with me here, I've got Peter Leon, a uh, mining legal expert of uh, Herbert Smith and Freehills. Um, and the basic question I have to start off with, how do you think this mining charter might stand up before a judicial review, before a full bench? I don't think it's going to stand up very well, Chris. Uh, there are a whole lot of problems with it, and one of which, which is a key plank in the Chamber of Mines, and indeed the industry's attack on it, is effectively what the minister's done with this third version of the mining charter is give himself legislative powers, which he doesn't have. I mean, you have a separation of powers in South Africa without being too technical, a legislature, judiciary and executive. But when the executive starts legislating, that raises real uh, separation of powers, rule of law issues. And why do I say that? Because this document, which is about 50 pages long, uh, contains a whole lot of rules and regulations around uh, black economic empowerment, around socioeconomic transformation, which effectively have the force of legislation. And that was never the intention behind the Mining Charter. If you go back to the original version of the Mining Charter, which came out in 2002, which came into force in 2004, it was a very uh, broadly worded policy document where government, labor and business agreed a set of principles to bring about socioeconomic transformation of the mining industry. This document, by contrast, is really a set of legislative prescripts uh, proposed by the minister purportedly to take effect on the date that the charter came out, which is in the middle of June uh, 2017. So that's the fundamental problem uh, with Mining Charter 3. I think a second major issue, again, and this is where I think uh, potentially um, the, the government's case could well collapse, 
is that if you look at the Mining Code, the Mineral Petroleum Resources Development Act, Section 100, which is the power that the Minister had to create the Mining Charter, that power only rested with the Minister once, and that was back in 2004 when the Charter came into force. With the said, the Act says, within six months of the Act coming into force, a new charter has to, a charter has to be proclaimed. But the Act contains no power uh, to the Minister to amend the, the original charter or indeed to create a new mining charter. So that, those, are, you know, those are technical legal points, but they're very important. And if either one of them succeeds, or both succeed, then uh, I'm afraid the government's case is dead in the water. Well, before we break down which mm. parts of the mining charter are likely to fall down in court, I mean, we talk, talked there about consultation. This is supposed mm. to be done in consultation with not only the mining companies, mm. also the unions, also the communities that live around mines. Mm. Uh, one thing that struck me when the um, amendments were released last year is that the Chamber of Mines was invited to the press conference, along with us journalists, to be told about something they knew nothing about. Um, what's been well, going the, on the, the government's argument about that, which I think is debatable, but their argument is that in fact there were uh, a series of consultations with the industry after the original charter, draft charter came out in April uh, 2016. So between April 2016, June 2017, there were a lot of meetings with the organised industry, with individual mining companies, with law firms, uh, accounting firms and so on. But the Chamber's argument, uh, which I think is, is how hard to deny, is that there was no discussion with them uh, as the organised body of the industry uh, about the content of the revised charter. So they were having discussions with the industry about the April version, April 2016 version of the charter, but nothing was ever shown to the industry as to what this document would land up looking like. So that, I mean, there really is an issue around consultation. And if you go back again, because I was involved in both of them, the 2002 charter and the 2010, the second version of the mining charter, they were extensive in engagements with the industry back in 2002 and back in, in 2010. In fact, in 2010, uh, there was a, like an eight, nine month consultative process and I was actually uh, with the government and the industry in the Drakensberg, where they actually had a summit uh, for two days to discuss what would be in, in that version of the Charter. Now, none of those things happened this time round, and so I think that is a, a legitimate complaint. And um, let's break down the mining Charter. In order of importance, which parts of it do you think are likely to fall down before the eyes of a uh, full bench of judges of the Judicial Review? Well, look, the, the, the points I made at the beginning, the technical attack on the Charter for being ultra vires or the Minister not having the power to do what he purports to do, to have done, uh, those could actually nullify the whole the government's case. But there are other specific provisions in the Charter which are uh, legally, let's put it, very problematic. Uh, the provision, for example, that 1% um, of the company's revenue has to be paid to black shareholders uh, or black entrepreneurs before anyone else, uh, before dividends are declared. That obviously violates the Companies Act. There's another rather strange provision in the Charter which says that, because obviously most um, black economic empowerment transactions are financed by the mining company, in other words, they're vendor financed. There's another very strange provision in, in this saying that the loans to black shareholders to pay for their shares if they're not paid back within 10 years, just simply have to be written off, which is bizarre because that you know, effectively is an expropriation. So you know, I, I don't think enough uh, legal thinking or advice was procured by the government, by the Department of Mineral Resources when they went about engaging this charter. Then there are provisions in the charter which I think potentially violate the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade and the General Agreement on, on Trade and Services, which South Africa signed up to back in uh, the Halcyon days mm -hmm. of 1993-94, uh, uh, when the WTO agreement came into force in 1995, basically says you can't discriminate against uh, foreign suppliers of goods and services. And what this charter does is say that 70% of all goods and 80% of all services have to be procured from South African 
producers uh, or suppliers of, of, of services. Again, that raises international trade law issues, which I simply don't think have been properly thought through. Then the other provision is not really so much a legal point, but the fact is that, you know, the, just from an economic perspective, saying to mining companies they have to move from 26% to 30% black ownership within one year is a huge cost to mining companies and to their shareholders, particularly when the government, you know, back in, I remember it very clearly, back at the time of the original mining charge in 2002, the government went around the world saying this is the 26% is written in stone, we're not going to change the goalposts. And that's exactly what's happened. And that's exactly why South Africa gets such, frankly, such a bad rap internationally when it comes to investor confidence in the mining industry because you can't keep changing the rules. Well, speaking about internationally, I mean, you mentioned the general agreement on tariffs and trade. Yeah. Should this mining charter go through and be considered in contravention mm. of GATT rules, what could happen then? Well, the, the, you know, the, the interesting thing about the GATT and the, and the WTO is that only member states can sue other member states. So companies or uh, importers of South African goods, uh, manufacture, I mean mining production, uh, wouldn't have recourse to the WTO, but a member state does. So what could happen is, say for example, if the uh, production of South African platinum is affected by this document, um, and of course that raises issues under the new amendment bill, which effectively uh, makes uh, uh, mining companies supply uh, local manufacturers with um, uh, with production at, at effectively a discount uh, to their actual costs, then you could have recourse to the WTO, but it would have to be through a member state. And the other issue uh, is worthy of mention, I think, we talked about increasing the level of black ownership from 26% to 30%. Mm. But um, what about the, uh, the court case that's going to go ahead with the Chamber of Mines saying that they still go for once empowered, always empowered, when they've, um, mining companies have removed uh, or transferred a stake in a company into black ownership, they have deemed to have done their job and that's that. How likely is that go ever going to happen, you think? Well, that's of course a separate court case by the Chamber of Mines. Now, the Chamber of Mines um, suspended the original case they had, hoping to try and reach some sort of negotiation with the government, which didn't happen. So that, that case has already been heard, and we'll have to see what the outcome of it is. Uh, clearly, if uh, either side doesn't succeed, and obviously one of them will not, uh, there are going to be a series of appeals, uh, potentially all the way to the Constitutional Court. The problem here, Chris, is that the, um, the mining charter, the the first version, the second version, rather vague around this issue. Uh, the government's argument is that mining companies have to continually re-empower themselves and if there was any provision to the contrary, it would appear in the mining charter. But the mining charter is not clear about this. But looking at it again from an economic rather than uh, a legal perspective, it, it's again a huge cost to mining companies if, um, if their black shareholders want to sell out, they should be able to do so. I mean, otherwise you're effectively saying, and this is what this document says, this document actually, you know, basically knocks the once empowered, always empowered principle on the head and basically says, um, you have to continually maintain your empowerment requirements and black shareholders can only sell their shares to other black shareholders. Now that I think is actually very disadvantageous to black shareholders because basically locks them in to selling their shares to a small class of potential purchases, mm. and effectively, uh, you know, th that effectively means that th that sale could be at a discount, mm. and it, it means not at a market price. So I, I, I think that that is another problem with this instrument. And the big question everybody is answering: Should this be blown out of the water at the judicial judicial hearing? What happens then if the present mining charter is torn up and the government has to start again? Well, I don't think that would be a bad thing, frankly. I think what whatever the case, this. Um, Mining Charter 3 uh, is in, and this is a settlement uh, between the industry and the government, which could happen because obviously the country is going through major change now, potentially with a change of president, a change of mining minister may be in the works. Uh, there may be different thinking in Pretoria around this. So there could be some negotiated settlement, but there isn't one. If there isn't one, and this thing does go to court and does get heard uh, in February, in the ordinary course, there's bound to be an appeal and an appeal to the Court of Appeal and then to the Constitutional Court. You're looking at two or three years of litigation 
around this thing. So this, this document is not going to see the light of day for many years. And lastly, um, very briefly, foreign investors watching all of this, what do you think they're thinking? They're uh, not exactly terribly positive, although I have to say, um, it's interesting, I, I was at a JP Morgan investment conference in Cape Town in December, uh, and the, the, there was an interesting view there, which is actually not the, the received view. You need to take a long-term view of South Africa, and the long-term view is much better than the short-term view. And I think that does give reason, give us reason to be somewhat optimistic at the beginning of 2018. Peter Leon of uh, Herbert Smith and Freehills, thank you very much for your insights as always. Fred, that's all we've got time for on this special edition of Political Capital, looking into the mining industry. Don't forget, mining in Darwin next week. And February the 19th to the 21st, the judicial review of the mining charter that may change the course of the industry in this country. From me, Chris Bishop, it's goodbye. <laughs>